Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regame to video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the i9-9900K. There has been a slew of rumours concerning the ninth generation processors recently, but now we have yet another one, and this comes to us from Gollum.de. These actually reinforce earlier rumours. Now, according to Gollum.de, they are telling us that the i9-9900K will indeed be soldered, so we will not be seeing toothpaste for the 9900K and hopefully the remainder of the ninth generation processors. According to the German website, multiple industry sources have actually confirmed these details to them, so this is actually really good news. Uh, now we have multiple reports that these chips will actually be soldered, and at least if you believe the rumours, these chips should be good for clock speeds of up to 5.5 gigahertz. And from further uh, leaks, we've also ascertained, of course, that the specifications of these chips, eight core, 16 threads, a single uh, core will indeed boost all the way up to five gigahertz. And I believe that's the same for two cores as well. But when all of the cores are active, of course, we do see the clock speeds diminish by several hundred megahertz. But even so, that's still pretty damn impressive. Now, whether that's going to be enough to tempt people to jump from one generation to another, particularly when it comes to gaming, like if you've got, for example, 8700K, well, I think you're probably going to be good for some time. I mean, six cores, 12 threads, it's an awful lot of performance. And we have also recently covered the rumours that the 9700K will not have hyper-threading, which is really bizarre, very different from the uh, 8700K, and indeed most of Intel's history of late. It will be curious to see what the performance of these things is. Obviously, hyper-threading can either have a really nice improvement in performance or it can diminish performance. Now, how much performance impact generally does depend, but 25% to 40% is typical. 25% on the lower end if it does improve things, 40% on the best case scenarios, typically synthetic benchmarks, that type of scenario. But even so, I imagine it's going to be very difficult to convince someone to go from, let's say, an 8700K to a 9700K. So I imagine for a lot of folks, they're just going to want to keep those additional threads because it does sound a lot cooler, right? 12 thread processor versus an eight core processor. But I say that without the knowledge of how these processors overclock on average. So if we, for example, we see an extra 500, 600, 700 megahertz on the A700K in terms of clock speed, plus we have this additional, uh, you know, couple of extra cores, it might be that in games at least, and possibly even some content creation applications, it might be the 8700K uh, does lose out to the 9700K, and it's most likely, of course, that the 9900K will remain top dog. As a slight aside, I'm going to be very, very, very curious to see how memory uh, clock speeds do impact these processors with the additional uh, memory bandwidth that you'd assume these processors will require. And the last point, I'm going to also be interested to see how power is going to uh, be affected, what type of power consumption these processors are going to bring to the table, along of course with what boards, for example the Z370 boards, are actually going to support these processors. Are we going to see some boards that just don't work very well, they don't overclock better, compared to the Z390 I got there in the end, and so on. And now we're going to go into rumours of the GeForce GTX 11 series or 20 series. There hasn't exactly been an official name put forward yet by NVIDIA, although Lenovo did hint that we're going to be call, calling these new cards the 11 series, but it might just be a placeholder name. After all, the representative was not supposed to be talking about this stuff, in all honesty, and it's possible that he was just saying the 11 series because it was the name he chose in his head to be the most logical. So until, of course, if we do, do confirm this information, well, 11 or 20 series, who knows? But still, in regards to the rumor roundup, we have a couple of things which have been compiled by videocards.com, and they've got some of this information from the website DigiTimes and a couple of other sources as well. And it is rather interesting. For a start, DigiTimes are alleging that these new cards will be based upon the 12NM process from TSMC. Honestly, I would be shocked if it was anything else. I'm almost positive we're not going to be seeing the cards on, for example, 7NM or something like that. It's just going to be too cost prohibitive, and honestly, that node has been established. We know that it's what NVIDIA like. Uh, they've pretty much created their own variant of the node with their own customizations, and of course, it is being used for things such as their Volta uh, GV100 GPUs. It's still unknown yet 
what exactly architecture wise we're going to be looking at with the next generation GPUs from NVIDIA, in other words, the GTX 11 series or GeForce 11 series, if you prefer. Uh, there have, of course, been a couple of rumors concerning that. Uh, some of those have actually pop, uh, popped up, excuse me, from HW Info. You do remember that we did actually cover that just a couple of days ago. And according to those rumors, HW Info uh, changelog does indicate that we're going to be seeing support for the GV uh, cards, such as the 104. But it's possible that that nomenclature is not necessarily indicative of the final versions of the GPU. It could just be placeholders. It could just be that the architecture doesn't really make that much difference between Volta and Turing or whatever it ends up being called. It might just be that they've not included that yet. It could be it's for the Quadro series and so on and so on and so on. In other words, it's very early days. But I did want to just add that in. Digitimes.com also point out that the cards are going to start trickling in in August and then a month later after that, of course, we'll see the GTX 1170 and the 1180 Ti's and so on and so on. But these rumors have also been posted other places. It's unknown whether Digitimes.com are citing these sources or whether we're simply seeing them independently verifying this with AIBs or whomever. And of course, that's the reason they're posting that. But I did want to just point that out. But another thing that is almost certain at this point is that the long friend of GPUs, DVI, is going bye-bye. It's unsurprising. DVI connectors are pretty darn big. If you look at dual link DVI connectors, they're absolutely huge. Um, and well, those ports can probably be used for other things. What they're going to be used for? Are we going to be seeing another like 20,000 uh, display ports or HDMI connectors? No, instead we're going to be seeing the friend and buddy called uh, virtual link these rumors actually originate from chip hell and honestly this does make a lot of sense for me since we know that the virtual link type c connector um has actually been a collaboration from amd nvidia and of course others in the industry so dvi connectors are more of a legacy thing now most monitors that you buy of course would be display ports or hdmi variants and of course uh, one of the the consistent um, criticisms, I suppose, with uh, virtual reality headsets are the sheer plethora of cables that you've required to actually plug into the device. And it obviously is not the best for immersion. So to, for, to eliminate at least one of the cables and to have a single cable does make an awful lot of sense. Also, according to the rumors, we're also going to be seeing HDMI support for version 2.1. Again, I can almost be certain that those rumors do make an awful lot of sense. And there have been a couple of murmurs from industry, you know, industry sources that yes, NVIDIA are going to be embracing this technology given the release window of these cards and the HDMI 2.1 uh, specification and when it was rolled out. Honestly, I would be surprised if we didn't see that. So it all makes sense to me. We might as well continue with the big three. And now we're going to be moving over to our friends and buddies over at AMD. We're going to be starting things out with the good thing of their financial windfall. In other words, the fact that they've been doing extremely well of late. And that is that their R&D budgets have actually been increased 25, almost 26%. Now, this is obviously a really good thing. I don't need to spell that out to you. That's pretty bloody obvious. But imagine what the company can do with that additional cash flow. And it's pretty obvious that AMD have been doing well of late. You can just see their advertisements, their, their strategies have been a lot more aggressive. And obviously, if a, if a company has more cash, then they can afford to be more opulent. They can afford to be more bold in their advertising strategies because they don't necessarily need to go with tried and true uh, techniques all the time, right? They can be like, okay, well, we can go with these ads and these ads. And <laughs> We've even seen them be very aggressive when it comes to uh, Intel, right? With the whole Epic uh, lineup. <laughs> We've actually seen in airports, uh, AMD say very aggressive things, very mean things almost, like uh, Xeon ruled, so did the dinosaurs, and then instead be epic. And obviously these adverts are placed in very smart locations. If you put them in certain airports, certain travel destinations where they know a lot of IT professionals are going to be transitioning backwards and forwards, it obviously is going to spark interest and is going to also put that into the minds of CEOs and people who actually are controlling the budgets and being like, okay, well, I've heard of this. They've got the cash. They've obviously got the 
the, the financial clout to be able to advertise in these areas. Okay, well, I'm going to definitely listen to John or whomever at, uh, you know, this meeting because I've definitely heard of Epic now. It's not blindsiding me. And you'd be surprised how little things like that, little advertising strategies do make a difference. But of course, from the R&D side of things, it also is a really good thing. There are those rumors, and I'm repeating myself a little regurgitation here, uh, Navi, the reason that Vega kind of got kicked in the shin is by AMD's own uh, financial issues. It just didn't have the cash to be able to put it into both uh, Navi development, which supposedly is being primarily worked on for Sony, although I'm curious to see how that's going to impact Microsoft. And basically, Raj Akadori and the RTG team just did not have enough resources, and resources also being people, of course, because money equals engineering hours, to put into Vega. How true that is, well, who knows? I mean, Forbes did report it, so I do think it might have some potential for truth. But either way, the fact of the matter is, increasing your budgets by almost 30% is bloody good. We also have some more information from AMD concerning the 7nm Ryzen processors. There have been a smorgasbord of rumors concerning Ryzen 3000, which of course is going to be based on the Zen 2 micro architecture. One of those, and one of the more consistent rumors recently, is we're going to be seeing 10 to 15 percent IPC gains. I could imagine those rumors would probably be creeping out. After all, we've seen AMD start briefing um, various companies regarding the next generation of Epic processors. Now, there are some questions concerning how this is going to impact us as users. One of the consistent rumors we've also heard is that AMD are planning to up the core count for AM4. Just for those who are not too familiar with the Ryzen 2000 series and uh, 1000 series, the 2700X, the uh, 1700X, for example, had eight cores, 16 threads. That's, of course, thanks to SMT, simultaneous multi-threading. And they have ha enjoyed a rather nice game of one-upmanship on a, uh, against Intel, at least in the core count stakes. So the question is, are they going to continue to do this game of one-upmanship with Intel waiting in the wings with the 9900K? Well, yes, but according to Lisa Su, we are not going to see the Ryzen 3000 series debut until after the launch of 7nm Epic. So here's the gist of it so far. We had the original Zen microarchitecture launch, and then after the desktop variants, AM4, we of course saw the uh, Epic processors, and then we now saw the Zen microarchitecture evolve to Zen Plus, and along with it, we saw the 2000 series of Ryzen processors. I'm also simplifying this and taking out things such as the uh, mobile processors and all that stuff and APUs because it gets way too complex. But Epic skipped uh, Zen Plus. Instead, uh, they are moving straight to Zen 2. So we, as the desktop owners, as AM4 uh, platform holders, we will need to wait for a little bit. According to Lisa Su in an AMA, in an investment conference, she said that uh, 7nm Rome Silicon will be at the heart of the second generation Epic processor family. And then after that, uh, the Zen 2 based client segment product will be slated for 2019. And then after that, we will see the role of 7nm Ryzen processors, which will follow 7nm Epic. There are also questions which um, are still not quite clear yet regarding how these processors will be put together. So far, of course, Ryzen is put together with CCXs, which are based in four cores. So each CCX has four cores, and it's an eight-core processor. That's two CCXs. So if you scale up to a 16-core processor, for example, like the 1950X, the Threadripper variant, that means you need to have four of these CCXs. Four times four equals 16. That makes sense. This also means, in theory, we're going to see increased latencies. So one of the consistent rumors is we're going to see two variants of these CCXs. The first is an eight-core variant, uh, which means that you're going to see eight cores per CCX. And the second variant is going to have six cores per CCX. That has been another consistent rumor. And finally, AMD are not content on 7nm. You might think, well, 7nm is pretty darn good, and it is, but they also have you for the future. According to Lisa Su, we have seen the first few of 5 nanometer, and we think that 5 nanometer is very competitive as well. And on top of that, 7nm Radeon Instinct Vega GPUs are already shipping to its partners. So I just want to clarify, they are already shipping 7nm Vega. 
And on top of that, they think that there's going to be an official launch later this year, which will obviously do wonders for their graphics card sales. And accordingly, AMD are focusing on hyperscale data centers. There has actually been no confirmation regarding 7NM for desktop. So most analysts do predict, and AMD, of course, are still being rather quiet on this, but it does look like we're going to be seeing 7NM for desktop hit sometime next year, which is a bit of a shame, yes, but it does make sense. And honestly, in a way, from my point of view as a gamer, it's kind of a double-edged sword. <laughs> I love the idea of having AMD be competitive in the gaming segment right now. That would be amazing. I would love AMD to do a sneaky launch of like Navi right tomorrow and be like, there you go. Uh, here's what we're going to be competing against with uh, in terms of like NVIDIA and AMD competition. That would be amazing. But for longevity's sake and getting the company back on financial track and possibly for the future of the GPU division of AMD, I don't mind them actually focusing, at least for now, on the 7NM4 data centers because it's going to be very lucrative and obviously they can push that money back into the gaming side of things with the GPUs and who knows what's going to happen, especially since we know that Intel are going to be uh, pursuing this rather, well, uh, super aggressively and hyper aggressively. It's Intel and obviously even uh, NVIDIA are aware that in 2020, uh, Intel are going to be here to play, play. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. There's going to be a bucket load of content over the next uh, several days, actually. We've got a ridiculous amount of stuff to review, including... more memory. Uh, we've got a new test system, as you can see in the background here, we're actually reviewing that. And we've got the B360 motherboard that we've just finished reviewing as well, which is over there. We've done a lot of testing on that, so that's also going to be edited for this weekend as well. So do stick with us. We had a bit of a delay because uh, we were working with a manufacturer and they asked us to actually not put up one review because they actually upgraded their product lineup just as we were finishing the review, which was kind of, it is one of those things, it just kind of what happens when you're a reviewer. So they asked us not to put up that review, which meant uh, several days of testing went down the drain. But the good news is they're giving us a new uh, set of products to actually test. So I'm okay with that. And obviously we don't want to put up a review if like a new product's been put out. It kind of is what it is. So I just want to give you guys that little bit of insight into why the reviews have been a little slower recently. But anyway, uh, as I said, that will be coming up over the next few days and a lot more testing besides. With all of that said, thanks very much for all of the recent support, the likes, the comments and the shares and the emails and goodness knows what else. It's, well, just awesome. You can also find us a quick shout out on Patreon as well. You know, that, that's not to say you have to donate or anything. That's just to say that it is there. And if you want to consider donating, well, obviously that does help us uh, produce content, upgrades cameras, and all the normal stuff that you can imagine. But for now, I'm going to let you all go. I appreciate your time. Take care. Bye.